We've talked about the fact that the area under the bell curve, the area under the normal distribution, is really how you end up calculating your answers and finding your answers. We said the area under the whole thing is just equal to 1, and the area of any little chunk is going to end up being how we solve a lot of these problems, and we're kind of giving you a taste of that. But we also said um, that when we calculate those values, we could use the actual equation and we could use calculus to find the areas, but that's cumbersome. We don't really want to do that. We'd like to use the table of values that are given in the back of almost every statistics book ever printed. All right? If you go and look in your Appendix A in the back of whatever textbook you're using, you'll see uh, what we call uh, a table for the normal distribution. And it kinda, I'll show you how to use it. Basically, it lets you calculate these areas. But the problem is, you see, um, remember that the normal distribution, the shape of it, is dependent upon the mean and the standard deviation. So let's say I have a problem with watermelons, and I tell you the mean is 20 inches and the standard deviation is 5 inches, right? And then let's say in another problem, I'm doing something with the height of adults in, in North America, and their height is, you know, average is 60 inches, and their standard deviation is 15 inches. So you see those two different problems, they're both using normal distributions, so we want to use the same table in the back of the book, but one of them has a totally different mean and a standard deviation than the other one. So how do we calculate areas under both of these curves when both of the curves are totally different shapes? And some, one might be short and squishy, one might be tall and peaked, but we both know they have the same general shape, but we want to use the single table in the back of the book. The answer is we create something called the standard normal distribution. The standard distribution is the one that's printed in the back of the book, the one that's tabulated with the areas. And what you need to do is when you solve your problems, what you end up doing is kind of converting your problem into a standard distribution. Then you can look the answer up in the back of the book. Because otherwise, see, there's infinite different shapes and sizes of these normal distributions. I could have a mean of 20 million and a standard deviation of 10,000 if I'm talking about the diameter of a star or something. Well, if I, if I want to calculate area under that curve, it's going to be a totally different table than if I'm talking about watermelons, you see? So what we do is we create the standard distribution, and we use that for all of our problems, and we just have to do a simple little conversion in order to be able to use the table in the back, but it's very, very simple to do. That's what we, the motivation of why you need a standard normal distribution. All right? So what would be a standard normal distribution. What is it? Well, there's a couple of different things you need to know. It's the same bell shape. All of these things are bell curves, these normal distributions, so it has the same shape as all the other ones we've looked at. Number two, for the normal distribution, we kind of normalize and change it, and we say the mean is equal to zero. And for the third thing, we say that the standard deviation is equal to one. So you see, when I'm talking about watermelons, my mean might be 20 and my standard deviation might be 5. When I'm talking about diameter of stars, the mean might be 20 million and the standard deviation might be 10,000. If I'm talking about the price of homes, the mean might be 200,000 and the standard deviation might be 50,000. You know? So all those numbers will be different. So when we tabulate um, the standard distribution, the standard benchmark that we're going to use to solve our problems, we just say that the mean is zero. So all that means is the curve is centered about zero on the axis there, the horizontal axis. The standard deviation is changed to be a one. And so what we can do when we solve our problems is we can change, listen, this is important, we can change any normal distribution we want to be into standard form, right? Then we can use the table to calculate the area and then we have our answer. So, what you're going to have to do for all of the problems that we solve is figure out the relevant information, change the, the normal distribution into standard form, and then after that I'll show you how to use the table to calculate uh, the answers. So, the way that we convert, the way that we convert a, a normal distribution to standard form is with the z-score. And I know that you remember that because we covered it in volume one. And let me go ahead and write that down. It's very important. I'll remind you. The z-score is equal to x minus mu over standard deviation. So I'll kind of circle that. That's important. Very simple equation. Basically, the z-score is equal to whatever value of x I care about minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. 
So I encourage you at this point to go back to volume one and watch my lesson on z-scores if you kind of forget, forget you know, exactly what they're for. We introduce them in the past to, um, for a specific purpose and we solve problems. Basically, the z-score is taking your data and telling you how many standard deviations your data is from the mean. So you take your data point minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. It tells you how far away it is from the mean. Notice the numerator here. If you just take this part off, and I have a data point minus the mean. The top part tells you how far away my data is. That's this thing. How far away my data point is from the mean, right? In, in terms of absolute value, I just subtract it. But then I take the result and I divide by the standard deviation. And it tells me how far away my data is from the mean in terms of standard deviations. Am I one standard deviation from the mean? Am I one and a half standard deviations from the mean? And so on. That's kind of the definition. But the bottom line is this is how we convert a regular distribution to a standard normal distribution. So this kind of seems unfamiliar or weird. I encourage you to go back to volume one and watch that lesson. It's the very last lesson uh, there. So let's do a problem. So we have a normal curve, normal distribution. Um, it has a, a mean of 48 and a standard, oops, a standard deviation of 5. So this is a typical uh, distribution, um, non-zero mean, non-zero standard deviation. Convert to standard normal distribution and show where x is equal to 45 would be on this distribution. So the bottom line is we want to draw two bell curves, or two no normal distributions. The first one we draw wants to be our original distribution that we're given. The mean and the standard deviation, we want to draw it. Then we want to convert it to the standard distribution and draw it again, and I want to show you where this point would be in the new distribution, the newly transformed distribution. So we're taking baby steps here a little bit. You're going to need to do this for almost every problem uh, we solve. So let's start out by saying or by drawing our first distribution. So what we have here is 48, because that's the mean, right? And notice that the standard deviation is 5. So one standard deviation above the mean uh, would be, if you add 5 to this, would be 53, right? And if you take one standard deviation to the left, you'd be subtracting 5, and so you'll be at 43. So this guy is one mean minus the standard deviation, and this guy is one mean plus the standard deviation. So we just put those on there because I'm trying to draw a representation of my original curve. All right, so let me do my best to try to draw this properly, and I don't know if I'll succeed, but I'll give it a shot. So we'll do something like this, and on the other side. And notice I'm trying, I'm, I may not be doing a good job, but I'm trying to make my standard deviations line up with the inflection points where the curve changes direction because it gives me a, an idea of how spread it is. So this is an idea of my original distribution. So original distribution, right? There we go. Now, I'm telling you, the standard normal distribution has the same bell shape, but the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. All right, so let me draw right next to it another distribution. We know that the mean is zero because of given that, and the standard deviation is one. Uh, so we'll put one standard deviation at plus one and one standard deviation at minus one. Now let me try to, again, draw this curve. May not be perfectly exact, but I'm trying my best. I'll come down here. I'll draw this one like that, all right? So you see they look the same, and I'm claiming that these two things are basically equivalent. This is just a different way of representing the original distribution. You see the shape is the same. It's just that this one is centered around zero with the standard deviation that's just plus or minus one, like that, whereas the original one was given like this. So that's how you convert it, so to speak, to standard form. But the question is, where would x equal 45 be on both of these graphs? So I'll draw this in green. If this is 48, this is 43, 44, 45, so this somewhere right around here would be 45, right? So we're guessing that it should be right around here somewhere, but we don't know where exactly it would fall. So we have to convert, see, each value of x, we convert it to a z value. Um, 
see this guy here, this is length, let's say in inches or whatever it is, okay? And then over here, this is now converted to a standard distribution and this, this axis here is no longer the original length that we were dealing with, it's something called z. Everything has changed so that it's a standard variable. All right, so how do we calculate this value here? So we said, let me change colors here real quick. We said that z is equal to x minus the mean over the standard deviation. Now in this case, x, the, the value of interest is 45 minus the, stand, the uh, mean, the mean here of the original curve was 48, and the standard deviation of the original curve was just 5. So we'll put a 5 there. All right, so what we get on the top, 45 minus 48 is negative 3, and then we will have 5, negative 3 fifths. And when you get that, it's negative 0 0.6, negative 0 0.6. So the point is, in the original curve, here's my curve, and the value, there is a value here in between these points called 45, x is equal to 45. In the new curve, this point is represented by negative, here, let me draw it on top, negative 0 0.6. Make sure you understand that, and I know that, <laughs> I know that it's kind of hard to understand why we're doing this stuff right now, because we haven't solved any practical problems. But just try to take it on faith that eventually I'm going to be asking you to find areas under this curve. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is by using the table in the back of the book. And the only way you're going to be able to use that table is if you're not dealing with your original curve, if you're dealing with this thing called the standard distribution. So every data value that you care about in your problem, you're going to end up converting into a z-score is, is what it's called because this distribution was originally length in inches and then the corresponding probabilities, we change it into something called a z-score. Don't worry about why it's called a z-score. It's because it's no longer the original length. They had to call it something. So they call it a z-score, right? So this is the new label. The mean of the distribution is at zero. The standard deviation is no longer what it was. It's standard deviation is simply plus or minus one. And every single value along the length, if this is watermelons, every single watermelon length that we cared about originally can be then transported into this z-score with this equation, you see? So the one that we cared about here was x was equal to 45. We put it into x, we subtracted the mean, and we divided by the standard deviation, and we get a number. This is the number that corresponds to this number, right? In fact, if you really want to be cute and see, uh, we already said here 53, this was one standard deviation. Let's convert this, let's just, for giggles, let's convert this to a z-score. z is equal to x minus the mean over the standard deviation, right? So then x here, let's say it's 53, minus the mean, which is 48, over the standard deviation of this guy, we said was five. 53 minus 48 is five over five. So what you get is one. So the z, this number here, 53, in terms of z is equal to one, which is exactly what we have written over here. So the standard deviation here was at 53. The standard deviation here is one because everything is normalized to the standard normal distribution. So following on to the next lesson, make sure you kind of understand this. I don't expect you to be rock solid with it right now, but I expect you to kind of know what we're doing. The idea is you start with something, you convert it to the standard form so that we can solve problems, so that we can use our tables. Following on to the next section, we're gonna do a few more of these kinds of problems so that you can get some experience and some practice with it. I know it seems like a foreign concept, but basically these z-scores, this is the only thing you're able to look up in the back of your book into the tables. It's a table of z-scores and probability. So if you just try to do it with this, you can't do anything. You have to convert any values you care about to z values so that you can look them up in the back. And we're inching our way there, um, but I want to show you why we're doing it. We're changing it to the standard normal distribution. So follow me on to the next lesson. We're going to work a few more of these guys, give you a little more practice with showing you how this transformation happens, and then we'll finally start solving some problems so that you can get some practice with that. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.